Welcome to the fifth NC4 conference, and in particular to the, the session on cloud lightning. My name is uh, John Morrison. I'm a professor in the computer science department in UCC. I'm a PI in IC4, and I'm a director of the Bull Center for Research and Informatics in, in Cork. Um, I'll start by giving a, a brief overview of the Cloud Lightning project, and then we have uh, three other speakers after that, and I'll introduce those as, as we go. So this is the structure of my talk here. I'm going to give a, a brief, uh, this is just a brief overview. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the funding and the consortium that's involved in the project. The specific challenge that we are, we've, ta we've taken on in the project with respect to the, the, the call from Horizon 2020. Then we look back, we'll see how the typical uh, IaaS infrastructure as a service cloud usage is today. From that, we'll see that there are some issues that we want to address, and we'll look at then some project goals and ambitions. We'll describe our approach to, um, to, the, to addressing those goals and ambitions. Um, and then I'll talk about the Cloud Lightning architecture. We'll see who the beneficiaries of that the project will be, and then I'll finish with just some, some challenges. I'll do this in about 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll move pretty quickly. Um, the project is funded through Horizon 2020. Um, we were funded in uh, February 2014, and the project runs for three years. I think everybody's familiar with uh, Horizon 2020 here, at least. The project consortium, there are eight members. We have two industry members, Intel and Maxler, and then we've got six academic uh, partners. Uh, from uh, Greece, Romania, Norway, and, and Dublin, uh, sorry, Ireland and uh, Dublin and Cork. The specific challenge then um, that comes from the, the call for proposals from the Horizon 2020 was this one. So it basically said that cloud computing is being transformed by new requirements such as heterogeneity of resources and devices software-defined data centers, cloud networking, etc. Uh, cloud computing research will be oriented towards, and then it gives examples of new computational data models, rising heterogeneity, demand for low energy solutions, etc. So we, in our project, are concentrating on those issues here, the heterogeneity of resources and devices, the rise and, uh, rising demand for better quality of user experience, new computational data models, rising heterogeneity of access modes and devices and demands for low energy solutions. So this is roughly the area that, that our proposal was targeted towards. So if you look back and see, look at the, the, the extant situation for infrastructure as a service at the moment, you'll find that there are basically two actors. So there's the customer and there's the provider. And in this model, the customer really has to do all the hard work. If the customer wants to have infrastructure as a service from a cloud service provider, they have to research various offerings. They have to build, compile solutions accordingly. In doing that, they effectively target the lowest common denominator. When they look across the cloud service provider, they'll see what, does, what do these providers have. And if I want um, to be able to build a solution that doesn't um, lock me into a particular vendor or, or supplier, then I typically will have to choose the lowest common denominator of all of those uh, suppliers. So our solution typically then ends up being generic, um, and that's an opportunity cost. If the customer goes towards some specific exotic hardware offered by one uh, provider only, then um, he or she risks the loss of portability. Now, in this model, the, the, all the provider effectively does is um, sells the access to the resources and makes sure that there's enough there by just over-provisioning. There's a strange thing happening here. <coughs> when the customer buys infrastructure as a service to do a particular job, they will be concentrated on implementing what they want to do on, the, on that hardware. They're not really worried about um, energy consumption. The provider is going to pay for that. They've already paid for the resources, access to the resources. Once the provider has, has provided the resources, they have no opportunity to manage the power after that. So the power falls between these two stools. So this is kind of a, uh, just an observation. Nobody has any incentive to look after the power consumption. So 
So the goals and objectives of the, of the Cloud Lightning project then is to try to make this cloud computing more access, accessible to the average uh, customer, to make it easier to, do, to go through the process that I just mentioned, so that the customer doesn't have to be an expert and doesn't have to know everything about every provider. We also want to make um, the, uh, allow um, the provider to make their offering more efficient. What does that mean? Well, currently the cloud is consuming about 10% of the world's electricity. That's an enormous amount of electricity, and it's set to get bigger. So providers are really focused on trying to reduce their electricity costs. As you see from the previous slide, they find that very difficult to do in an IaaS, uh, in an IaaS model. We also want to take advantage of new hardware that is coming on stream. We want to exploit heterogeneous hardware like GPUs, multi-integrated cores, data flow engines, in general, field programmable gate arrays, etc. These are coming on stream all the time. They're energy efficient. They provide for better, uh, faster solutions. But there's, a, there's a, a, a learning curve there for the customers. So they're hard to use, etc. So this, this Whereas these, these hardware are very desirable, they're very difficult to incorporate into our current cloud model. And if that wasn't enough, we want to try and demonstrate our approach in uh, a very challenging application domain using high-performance computing. Effectively, we want to try and exploit high-performance computing in the cloud. So it's a very ambitious project from that perspective. <coughs> so the approach is this. We want to uh, establish a separation of concerns between the customer and the provider. As I said before, the customer in, in the existing model reaches in and configures the, the resources within the uh, provider's environment. The provider gives them access and then loses control. What we want to do is we want to give control back to the provider by establishing a very clear boundary between the customer and the provider. We think that well, our, our approach then is to, to, uh, to look at the, um, uh, the, the following way of creating uh, services within the cloud. We see that, we postulate that there, there are, there's a service catalogue. These services are created by expert uh, programmers. This service catalogue uh, effectively um, will detail uh, specific implementations of possibly large applications. Each of these services could be a high-performance computing uh, application in itself. So these are pre-built and they're in a catalogue, and that we, we also postulate that they're profiled to a certain extent. We then see that there's, there's a, a, an actor, which we call a blueprint creator. The blueprint creator will take these services and will combine them into a workflow so that we can uh, sequence these uh, services or we can, we can get them to communicate with each other as, as necessary. This workflow we call a blueprint and once the blueprint is created we can then save it again as in, in a catalogue known as a blueprint catalogue. Another actor which we we're calling the enterprise application operator can go to this catalogue, take a blueprint from the catalogue, a workflow of services from the catalogue can parameterize it or constrain it in particular ways. We can he can say, for example, that this uh, collection of services should, um, should be as quick as possible or should be as cheap as possible, etc. So constrain it, put particular requirements on it, say, might say something like uh, th this, this blueprint um, will operate on data of a particular size, etc. That constrained and uh, uh, blueprint is then sent to our system through a gateway. Our system will discover the appropriate services for that, um, that, that, set, that, for that blueprint. And those services will be returned, or sorry, those resources will be returned, and the, service, the services will be deployed on, on top of those resources. Once that deployment happens, the end user will then interact with the deployed service. So here we're seeing that the, the, the customer is saying what they want, and uh, they're being very specific in what they want, and they're, they're developing a service level agreement. 
and the provider is saying how that will be done. So we're giving the control to the provider to say exactly how it will be done. <coughs> Our conceptual architecture then looks something like this. Um, well, first of all, maybe what, what, yeah, what I should say here is that in, in going to this situation, we are putting a lot of complexity into the realm of the, the service provider. Heretofore, the customer was doing all the work. Now the, the provider has to do all the work. For every individual customer, the provider has to come up with a, a solution of how the customer services will be implemented. And that gives rise to a very complicated uh, in, uh, environment for the, for the <coughs> CSP. <coughs> so we see one way of, of, of tackling that, uh, that complexity is using um, the idea of self-organization. The, the idea is this. That as the service as, as the service description comes into the uh, into the gateway, the resources that that are that would be needed for those service those services is determined internally in, in our system, um, as I said, using um, uh, self organizing a self organizing approach. My my slides are going to be a little bit awry, and I, I'm I'm after uh, I'm after losing my train of thought. So I I, I apologize for that for a moment. So. Effectively, what we're doing here is we're trying to go back to a situation where instead of having the provider having to, to deal with all of this complexity in one, in one go, the provider says, well, I have to try to manage this complexity by, by, by delegating responsibility to the underlying resources to manage themselves. So as I said, we're moving towards a system of, of self-organization to try to get a handle on on the complexity of, of the system. The basic tenets of self-organization is that each of the components has um, autonomy. The components within the system are aware of their environment, and these components are goal-driven, and they can self-configure. So in our model, uh, each of the, the components that I've outlined will have these, these behaviors. Each of these components as well then can have some local goals, and those goals could be locally to minimize energy or to improve service delivery. And those goals then are achieved through collaboration. So components will talk to each other. They'll decide who best in a local environment can, uh, can address a particular situation with those goals in mind. So, for example, one component might say, well, uh, I'm, I'm very underloaded. Um, so I can take the service without really increasing my energy, overall energy consumption. Um, and another decision could be, well, I'm, I'm, I have lots of services running. I can take another one. I won't increase my, my energy consumption, but my service delivery may be, may be impacted negatively. So these decisions effectively, uh, or these goals, will drive how those um, resource, resources are identified. So effectively, what we're trying to do here is we're, uh, we're, we're moving towards self-configuration that allows the system to create coalitions of resources or groups of resources working together to respond to the needs of separate service requests rather than having a menu of, of pre-packaged resources as we have in the, 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 the current situation. And that way, we hope to, um, to have a better match of services to resources. The Cloud Lightning system to try to, um, to try to get a handle on all of this, because these, these resources are, are, are rather complex, we introduce uh, an abstract notion of what we, what we call a, a CL resource, a Cloud Lightning resource. Now, these CL resources uh, are formed dynamically, or they're identified in the system in response to service requests. These resources depend really on what's in the system, what has been exposed physically in the hardware uh, layer or, or the hardware or the, the resource fabric of the cloud. So a CL resource could be, for, could example, 
for example, be bare metal. It could be a virtual machine. It could be a container. It could be a, a network um, of commodity hardware. It could be a network of specialized hardware. Um, it could be servers attached to accelerators such as GPUs, MICs, and FPGAs, etc. So all of these things we see as being different um, resources, some of which can be created dynamically, and others persist and uh, are, are created uh, essentially once and are used uh, often, or used over and over. These resources then are aggregated together in a, um, and given a specific identity. We call that a coalition. Now the reason we do that is because these services, each coalition will implement a, a single service. But these services in themselves could be parallel programs. They could require a number of resources working in concert to deliver that service. So each node in that blueprint could require a number of resources in itself. And typically those resources would be of the same kind, so they'll, they'll all be um, VMs of the same kind, they'll be containers of the same kind, they'll be uh, servers with GPUs of the same kind, etc. These coalitions are formed by a VRAC in response to the specific service request. So the service request comes in, the VRAC manager, who's managing this, this underlying uh, set of resources, will create these coalitions dynamically. So it may virtualize the hardware in response to the requests, or it may identify bare metal that can be given back in response to the request, etc. And as I said, some of these coalitions could be persisted for improved service delivery, so that when the service is finished, the container that was, that was delivering that service may, may persist, and then a, a service of the same kind coming into the system will, could, could be uh, implemented directly up upon that, uh, that resource without having to recreate the resource again, which can be a complex situation. If you persist a resource, then your service delivery um, goes up, or your time to service delivery goes, go, uh, goes down, so you, you, you can deliver service faster. But by persisting a resource, you use more electricity. So there's a trade-off there. If you dynamically create the resource, then um, you're only starting to use electricity when you're, when, you're, when you're spilling the resource up. However, the time to deliver the service or to the, it, it goes, uh, goes up. <coughs> We see that within a VRAC, or these, these VRAC managers are different, different types because we see different types of hardware within our system. So we, we may see a VRAC manager managing a group of commodity servers. We may see a VRAC manager managing a dedicated high-speed interconnect of, of, of servers. We may see another VRAC manager um, uh, managing a group of specialized <coughs> high-performance computing hardware. And the reason for separating or typing these things out is so that VRAC managers of the same type can self-organize so that servers can logically migrate between one manager and the, and the next so as to optimize the goals that I spoke about earlier. And that migration and that cooperation um, is restricted in, 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 in each of these cases. Okay. It's, you can imagine that for a high, uh, specialized HPC hardware that we don't have as many possibilities for reorganizing um, as we would for a, a group of commodity servers. We want to allow for the fact that as our system evolves, new hardware can come into being. And when that new hardware is identified, it can be registered with a plug and play environment. And that plug and play environment will dynamically create a cloud lightning resource associated with that, with that hardware. And that resource then will be associated with either an existing VRAC manager or if it's a new resource entirely, a, a new VRAC manager will be created to manage resources of that type. So in that way we can see our, our system evolving. In doing this, we, we're, we're not going to start from scratch. In fact, we haven't. We've already um, um, put together a development system uh, based on OpenStack. 
and we're using quite a lot of existing OpenStack components to implement, to implement our system. We have a number of things we have to build. Um, the bespoke VRAC managers that I spoke of, for, for example, the self-organizing and self-managing component. Um, but, but other components we'll be able to, to, to leverage directly, like the, um, the, 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 the Neutron uh, component, the, the Nova component, the Ironic component, et cetera, of, of OpenStack. The beneficiaries of this approach um, we initially think will be the, um, the IS service provider because the, I, the IS service provider will, get get, will be given control back over their resources. They will, be, they, they, they will have the ability to, in determining how a service is implemented, they will have the ability to make local decisions based on the, the current state of the cloud on how that service should be delivered. And delivering it in such a way as to try to maintain a service level agreement, but also to, uh, to minimize the energy uh, being consumed. We have a number of use cases in the high, in, in high performance computing environment, uh, uh, um, the high performance computing um, area. And these include oil and gas genomics and ray tracing. Uh, PK will talk about this one at, at the end uh, of the session. Um, and effectively here we see that We imagine that by being able to bring HPC machinery into the cloud, that we will be able to deliver these use cases with these advantages. It's important to say that, that we're, I'm not, we're not suggesting that we're just using the cloud to deploy HPC. It's not a matter of taking a HPC machine, plugging it into the cloud, and then deploying services onto that HPC machine. We're doing this in such a way that when the HPC machine is connected to the cloud and it receives HPC workloads, it acts exactly like a HPC machine. However, when there are no HPC workloads to execute, we are able to expose the resources behind the, or within that HPC machine to the cloud to deliver general service. And that, that is, I think, a very innovative thing of our project. So the challenges ahead then, uh, effectively what we're doing is we're separating the concerns of the IaaS consumer and the CSP. We are, we're doing that through the blueprint model. We want to create a service-oriented architecture for the emerging heterogeneous cloud. Effectively, this is the core of what we're doing. The, uh, uh, the, it, in creating that separation of concerns, we are, we are enabling this service-oriented architecture, which effectively um, gives us the advantages that I spoke of. We want to reduce energy consumption by improved IS management. We're looking to do that through uh, novel um, self-organizing algorithms within the system and having the system, the system components reorganize themselves based on, on local strategies and local goals. We want to improve service delivery by balancing persistent uh, resources with dynamically created resources. Um, as I say, we want to lever rev leverage het heterogeneity to bring HPC to the cloud. And as I said, it's not just as a deployment model, but to increase the, the utilization of these HP machines when they're not running HPC workloads by being able to get behind the machine and exposing their resources for general service delivery. And um, we're looking at resource in effectively resource management effectively in hyperscale cloud deployment. So we'd, we're, we imagine that this will be important when the clouds get very big, okay? Some of what, I can of what I've said already can be, can be done. Uh, you, you don't need, need self-organization to do it. The centralized uh, model will work up to a particular level. Beyond that level, you'll need something like this. Where that is, we're not 100% sure, um, but we're developing simulations to, to see that, to, to try to see where that transition point is. <coughs>